Good afternoon, uh, Sing Yao, Howard, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first of what we hope would be a series of really thought provoking uh, dialogues. So, the cutting edge is brought to you by the Straits Times and the Business Times with the support of Guaco Land. And the idea is to bring thought leaders to interact with you. People who are leaders and innovators and forward thinkers in their respective fields. So before I came over, I checked out the meaning of um, cutting edge. So the first definition I came across was that it is something that is the most advanced and the most recent. But if you think about it, what is the most advanced and the most recent on its own means very little. So I looked for another definition and I came across this one. And that is that cutting edge is something that gives you an advantage. And I think that is closer to what we are hoping to do with this series, that the conversations that we start here will give you an advantage in the way you look at business and the world around you. We are really lucky to have with us today Howard. Howard is Professor of Strategy and Innovation at IMD Business School in Switzerland. He is Director of their Advanced Management Program. He has worked with a whole list of Fortune 500 companies. His list of achievements is too long to, to list here. Howard brings with him lessons from 200 years of companies achieving, growing, thriving, and at the same time, failing and dying. And I am sure that he has a lot of ideas and insights to share with you all today. And I have no doubt that the conversation that he starts here will extend way beyond this afternoon, and it will help us change the way we see things. So once again, thank you all for coming, and I wish you all an afternoon of really interesting uh, debate and discourse. Thank you. Thank you, Wei Kong. I'd like to invite Cheng Xingyao, Guokoland Singapore's Group Managing Director, to say a few words. Xingyao, please. Thanks. <coughs> Afternoon, Wei Kong, um, uh, Howard, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for coming here tonight, uh, this, this afternoon. Um, I just want to express my thanks to SPH for partnering uh, Guacolan on this uh, very interesting series of cutting-edge talks, uh, and, and we really look forward to it. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about Guacolan. Uh, we are a real estate developer, uh, okay, quarter in Singapore, and uh, with businesses in Asia. Um, we have a history of about uh, close to 30 years, but uh, in many sense, we also feel like a relatively young company. Um, it's about 10 years ago that we transited and moved into the high-end market very successfully. And only about one year ago that we fully completed our first integrated mixed development, Tanjung Paga Centre, which happens to be also Singapore's tallest building. Um, for us, uh, no two pieces of land are exactly the same. Uh, every time when we look at a site, uh, we will have to consider it from fresh because lifestyles have changed, tastes, business environments, everything have changed. Uh, but at the same time, we also have to draw upon our experience to do it. Um, then what's important for us each time is to liberate ourselves from the baggage of the past, uh, to try to look at things with a fresh pair of eyes so that we can see the world for what it is and then also to find better ways to do things. And um, I, I would say that actually this has paid off. Um, a veteran in the industry told me a couple of nights ago when I met her at an event to say that uh, for our residential project, she finds that there's always something different every time we release something new, but at the same time, she can also identify a certain signature from Guacolan. Then our Tanjo Paga project, uh, which has a grade A office, hotel, residential, retail, and a park, uh, has done uh, very well commercially, even though we opened into one of the most challenging times of the market. Uh, on top of that, uh, it's already causing uh, a, a ripple of uh, change and rejuvenation to the Tanjo Paga district. Uh, and right now, we are learning more about place management. We are working with our neighbours to try to uh, transform and elevate the district even further. So, um, 
for, for, for a real estate developer, uh, there are many challenges. Uh, to name a few, uh, lifestyles are changing very quickly, businesses are disrupted, so we have to respond to the needs of our tenants and our buyers. Um, funds and capital and also uh, businesses are also moving across territories very uh, loosely. So in every market, uh, major gateway cities around the world, you have a lot more players and therefore the competition is more keen. So for us, uh, in responding to all these challenges, we, we certainly have to draw upon our strength and our experience of the past. But I think the challenge for us is also about how to not get uh, encumbered by formulas that have worked for us so far and, and continue to try to have a fresh pair of eyes to look at the way forward. So it's with that, I think I really think that uh, Howard's uh, talk today will be very relevant uh, for all of us. So with that, uh, I'd like again to thank you uh, all for coming, uh, friends and colleagues, and, and thanks. Good afternoon. Um, it's my great pleasure to be here. Um, we'll just wait momentarily so that um, the slide will get started. Um, so I just flown in from New York City and arriving 6 a.m. in the morning, but really excited. Um, so this is where Lausanne is, Switzerland. You see only vineyard and no skyscraper. And um, this is where I live, and this is where I teach, starting eight years ago. Um, before I joined IMD eight years ago, I was still in Boston at Harvard Business School, and at that moment, I always hear about a similar complaint by executive and manager, till today. And this is what they complain about. They said their product are always getting commoditized, meaning when the sales team go out, they said they're pricing pressure, it's harder and harder to differentiate the product in the marketplace. The value proposition seems to lack the resonance with their target audience. And then I oftentimes ask managers, so what do company do? What do large established company would do as a knee-jack reaction? Oftentimes, it comes down to two major responses. One is denial, right? It's not happening. Is our marketing team doesn't know how to do advertising. Uh, you know, is our customer don't get us. Then slowly, then they start to realize, man, we have to respond. They may try to have some cost-cutting measure, trying to get the cost structure right, trying to become the larger scale in terms of uh, volume or operation. But then I always warn them, this is really a last man standing strategy, right? There could be only one guy who has the lowest cost structure to compete in the marketplace. And then there's the third alternative. Company would try to innovate. Uh, if you're selling a hard product, you may try to wrap it around with solution or services and call it an integrated solution to customer. Now, whether it's a real solution to customer or solution for manager, that's up to debate. But imagine you are able to introduce new product and features to the marketplace. That customer really like it. You may add on new services. What happened is in six months down the road, these product features simply get copied. And then what do managers do? Well, they try to innovate again, and then they get copied. It's a never-ending race. And while this game of introducing new product features getting quicker and accelerated, they would inevitably see their cost structure begins to creep up. Why? Because of R&D, marketing expenses, consultant to sell services. And at one point in time, some low-cost competition might arrive from China, for example, and disrupt the whole game. And we've seen a similar dynamic across all industry, uh, from solar panel, to wind turbine, to personal computer, to mobile phone, went on and on and on. But then I realized this is actually not a recent phenomenon. In fact, we've seen new product innovation getting copied overnight by competitor all the way back to 250 years ago. Think about the textile industry. Once a point in time before the 19th century is the innovation hotbed for Great Britain. In fact, the textile mill worker or the machine maker, they're not even allowed to emigrate. If you are a textile knowledge worker, if people find out you're uh, trying to board on a ship to go to the United States, you will get arrested, jailed, and fined. Compared with today's non-compete in Silicon Valley, those are tame. But then the British Empire know that in order to protect their knowledge, they have to not let people to move abroad. But that doesn't matter, because Francis Lowe from New England 
committed sort of a, the biggest industrial espionage of history. So Francis Lowe from Boston, he's a wealthy merchant, and he just took a tour from Scotland to England to Ireland, trying to pretend that he's a tourist. But he's a Harvard mathematic, mathematics major. He has this great memory, photogenic memory. He's able to look at this machine and trying to memorize how it works and write down the blueprint and smuggle all the blueprint across to North America. And then in Lowell, now we know the town, he built the biggest textile uh, factory. But then 20 years later, it's no longer northern part of America dominate the textile industry. It's a southerner from North Carolina to South Carolina. They built even bigger textile plant for one export market. This is back in 19th century for the biggest overseas market, and that is China. Turns out the Chinese couldn't buy enough cheap cloth from United States in the 19th century. Kind of interesting ir irony for today. After the Second World War, however, the first dollar blouse begins to arrive from Japan to North America. All of a sudden, the Japanese dominate the textile industry, followed by the South Korean, the Taiwanese, then Hong Kong and Singapore, and then, of course, migrate across to mainland China, then India and Bangladesh. It's really an epic race to the bottom. Now, of course, every time when knowledge and industry migrate from one country to another, it's not just the implosion of one company. It's the implosion of a community. It's the whole industry cluster. And we have seen that again from automotive, like Detroit, turning into Rust Belt because of Honda and Toyota, all the way today in green tax sector, such as wind turbine. Historically, it's the exclusive domain for General Electric to Vastus, this Western company. Today, the largest wind turbine manufacturer is Go Wind. In fact, seven out of 10 are from mainland China. So I kind of get curious why that happened. And the reason is rather simple. Because in every industry, the industry knowledge always begins with sort of a craftsmanship type of industry know-how. That there is only a few scientists or engineers how to build this kind of new stuff. All the judgment are made based on human intuition, based on expert call, and so those are highly costly and difficult to learn. But in order to scale your operation, you have to write things down. Standard operating procedures, manual policy. The moment you write things down, things can get copy, borrow, and steal. And this is why when industry knowledge moves from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, inevitably, we see the latecomer always command an advantage over the pioneering company. It's almost like first mover advantage doesn't matter. And this is why we see oftentimes these latecomer would topple the industry incumbent. Now, when I mentioned this uh, claim, some executive would raise their hand in my class and say, how would you don't understand? Because I can always make the best product in the world and dominate the global industry. I'll be come the Rolex or long jean or my own industry. I'll go into the niche market. And this is when I kind of remind them a story of the piano war. So Stanway and Son makes the best piano in the, in the world. They make grand concert piano, arguably the best in the world. And no two pianos sounds the same. And from Lang Lang to Arthur Rubinstein, they love you Stanway grand concert piano. They grace White House all the way to museums. Um, but then, if you're looking at the financial history of Stanway and Son over the last 60 years, six decades, it's almost like an unmedicated disaster. They went up listed in New York Stock Exchange, couldn't survive, they get bought out by a private equity firm, and then went listed again later on, and gone private again, changed hand of ownership, despite all this artistic achievement. Historically, they own 600 acres of land in the tip of Astoria, outside of Manhattan. Over the years, they were forced to auction out all this land holding across Stanway Village, and today, they get reduced to one single factory at the tip of Astoria, and that's all. And who destroyed them? Japanese Yamaha. So when Yamaha came along, they don't even try to build grand piano, right? They were, were making upright piano for small home in Japan. Now, after the Second World War, of course, every Japanese who can afford one, they would want to buy one grand, uh, upright piano to learn Western music. 
And over the course of 20 years, Yamaha becomes the largest instrument manufacturer in the world, making low-end product. Now, around the 60s, Yamaha decided, why don't we try to enter the grand concert segment, the kind of lifeblood for Stanway and Son. How do they learn? Well, they buy Stanway and Son piano, take them apart, study the component part. And so Henry Stanway, the last CEO who bears the family name, who said, you know, if I ask a test to compare the engineering know-how between Yamaha engineers versus Stanway and Son, I'm really not sure who knows better. And so it's this idea, when Yamaha begins to enter the grand piano uh, businesses, they no longer use craftsmanship. They put in conveyor belt, automatic machine, doing mass production. So every time when industry know-how moves from the left, from intuition, to much more rule-based decision, of course it opens up for the opportunity to, for mass production and eventually move to automation. It applies not just piano making, but all the way to all kinds of industry, from automotive to PC to mobile. Now, there's a happy note, though. In Switzerland, there's a city called Basel on the eastern, eastern part of Switzerland. There, there are many, many pharmaceutical industry, from Novartis to Roche. And Novartis' predecessors called Sieber, Geige, and Sandoz, three company. They were settling down in River Rhine in Basel for more than 200 years. And yet today, Novartis is still commanding the leading position in drug discovery, together with Roche. In fact, the combined market valuation exceeds $250 billion. So I was very excited. I want to understand how do this Swiss mountain folk is able to stay on top of competition when everyone else from Detroit to Japan, Tokyo, pretty much succumbed to the pressure of latecomer competition. So I went up to Basel and going through their corporate archive to understand what happened. It turns out, Sieber, Geige, and Sandoz, historically, before the turn of the century, they were chemical dye maker. They make chemical dye for the textile industry. Now, some of these chemists, by accident, discovered there are medicinal benefit of their compound. So it turns out the world first blockbuster by this uh, chemical dye maker that they discover is called antipyrin. It's fever-reducing drugs. And uh, it was invented by Hoyce, a German company. In the land of counterfeit Switzerland, back in turn of the century, there's no patent law. So the local chemists, in fact, were encouraged to imitate foreign invention. Imagine that. So these guys from the Swiss and the German were manufacturing this called antipyrin and selling across the Atlantic Ocean in the United States. 1903, New York Times article said the only worry among the American is whether the German and the Swiss can manufacture as much of these fever-reducing drugs for North America. If you think for a moment, the hot bat for innovation or the foundational knowledge for innovation is all about organic chemistry. This is the foundational knowledge. Now, you might remember back in high school, Remember the story of Alexander Fleming, who discovered the first antibiotics, penicillin. It's by the study of microbiology, the modules, fungus secrete modules that kill off bacteria. All at a sudden, these companies, pharmaceutical firm, noticed that in order to find the next blockbuster, it's not so much about organic chemistry, but it's the study of microbiology. After the Second World War, Siebers, Geige, Sandoz, together with Pfizer in the United States, they essentially send in field workers, go up mountain, collect soil sample. They even ask for employee looking for interesting mold behind a refrigerator. Just to find out the next pay dirt, they send in balloon up into airborne to collect airborne sample. All of a sudden, the whole knowledge discipline really leap from organic chemistry to the study of microbiology. Now let me ask you, what's hot today in drug discovery? When people want to discover cancer drugs, what is the thing that people talk about these days? Genetics, right? Genomics, exactly. So today, if we go up to Basel, everyone is talking about the study of bioinformatics, genomics, it's based on, based on the biorevolution back in the 70s. So if we take a cross, broad view of what happened in the pharmaceutical industry, it's really this leap from organic chemistry 
to microbiology, to finally genomics. Compare and contrast automotive. Until most recently, it's really mechanical engineering based on internal combustion engine, and it has stayed stagnant. So one key element here is competition is almost like climbing up a mountain. If the underlying knowledge discipline stays stagnant, sooner or later the latecomer would reach the similar height. But if the underlying knowledge discipline continue to shift from one to the next to the next, then the mountain is almost like having constant mudslide, pushing everybody down. Now in that scenario, turns out it's the most experienced one. It's the pioneering company which stand a better chance to stay on top of competition. Why? Because in order to be great microbiologist, you need to understand chemistry very well. You pull a chemical dye on a cellular structure, you're looking under the microscope. In order for you to understand genetics, you have to be great in microbiology to begin with. So what you know in the past actually bear a very strong relevance into the future. So first mover advantage does matter, but is based on circumstance. Now, you may ask me, Howard, what if my own industry kind of stays stagnant in terms of its knowledge discipline, it's not high science? Am I doomed? So here is an interesting example that as mundane as a company making laundry detergents, natural soap, and disposable diaper, Procter & Gamble from Cincinnati, over 150 years, they continue to be the worldwide leader. Now, this is a counterintuitive example, because if in personal computer are displaced by Lenovo, Xiaomi, and all this guy, P&G should have no future, right? Because low tech is low tech. Laundry detergent is laundry detergent. Now, it turns out what happened in P&G is Mr. Proctor and Mr. Gamble, they form a partnership, business partnership, back in the 19th century. They call it P&G. So back then, most company would make natural soap by hand, hand dip operation. In Cincinnati, there is a huge uh, uh, industry called meat, meat packing. And in meat packing industry, they have really mastered mass production. Because before refrigeration is feasible, um, they really need to pack the meat very quickly. So what happened is the pack, for example, would be transferred by uh, conveyor belt or pulley system, then the worker would stay on one station, do one operation, and then the pig body would move to the next station, the other workers would do another part of the operation. Division of labor, decades before Henry Ford built the assembly plant. That gives P&G sort of blueprint how to build large factories. So that's all mechanical engineering, building big factory to produce natural soap. And then around the 20s, color printing become viable. So PNG guy decided, what if we do a lot of advertising based on color printing? And then around the 30 and the 40, radio become feasible. They observe one thing, homemaker and housewife love to get entertained. And so they sponsor opera on radio. That's called soap opera, by the way. So in order to entertain homemaker and housewife to sell more natural soap, and then television came along, they continued to stay in the vanguard of kind of advertising revolution. Now, all these are based on consumer psychology because you have to understand what causes a consumer to make a purchase decision. Now, arguably, there are many advertising agencies already there back in the turn of the century, P&G can easily outsource all of these to a third party. But P&G decided one thing, this is so critical to us, we have to build in-house. Exactly the type of conversation today many executives would have around the discussion of big data analytics or artificial intelligence, should we outsource or should we build in-house? P&G decided this is really important, we have to build in-house. Now, after the Second World War again, some of these engineers decided to or find out that they can actually artificially synthesize detergent. So that's, um, and then they decided this synthetic detergent can actually allow people to wash very cleanly on water, contain a lot of calcium or magnesium. So they decided to launch this brand called Thai. It's the Thai brand. In the wake of the launch of Thai, the number of cameras inside PNG 
quadruple overnight. So if you're looking at the long history of PNG, again, it's no longer just staying stagnate in one knowledge discipline, but it's the combination of mechanical engineering, consumer psychology, and finally, organic chemistry that allow PNG to stay on top of competition. Had they stay on the first one, at best, they would just be a low-cost competition fanning off the low-cost provider outside. So if we were to distill 250 years of industry history into one single buzzword, you've got to leap in a world when everything can be copied. So I kind of, in my research, I kind of look back to history on what happened in the past and try to then extract lesson into the future. If we need to leap to continue to thrive in today's day and age, where do we need to leap next? Let me show you some figures, and later on, when we have a conversation, we can explore more. But this is just a teaser. So, you know, this is not too long ago, just 12 years ago, the world's most valuable company is ExxonMobil, General Electric, Gazprom, Microsoft, Citigroup, Bank of America, Roche, Dutch Shell, BP, PetroChina, HSBC. These are formidable company, centuries of history. 10 years on, 2016, is Apple, Alphabet, that's Google, Microsoft, Berkshire Hathaway, so that's Warren Buffett Investment Company, ExxonMobil, Amazon, Facebook, j and GE, and China Mobile. So for executives like you, one of the key roles is recognizing what type of world we're living in so that you can capitalize the maximum out of the market opportunity and buffer your organization from the worst. And a couple of things jump out, right? In the past, on the left-hand side, is a lot of B2B company. They're asset heavy. If you own an oil field, if you have a mineral oil, if you have big factory, then you're king. Today, if you have data, if you have consumer interface, if you're in the B2C, if you have algorithm, that matters a lot. In fact, data is the new oil, as you can see right here. Now, I was curious whether this is just a fashion fad or this is something fundamental. So a few months ago, I still look back to what is the league table looks like. In fact, nothing has changed except there are two more companies pops up to the top list. That's Alibaba and Tencent. Kind of scary, right? But in fact, these are the sort of inevitable going on. And if you're looking at the tangible asset versus intangible asset, 30 years ago, most company valuation can be attributed to tangible asset, meaning your physical asset, your factory, your ship, whatnot. Today, only 25% of the company valuation can be attributed to these tangible assets. Most of these 75% are all intangibles, your brand, your know-how, your IP, your customer, and so on. I think there is one fundamental underlying that explains the shift of this uh, dynamic. One is ubiquitous connectivity, meaning it's no longer just connection by personal computer or smartphone, but it's machine to machine and human to machine as well. That really opens up new business model. That opens up new path to organize your innovation effort as well. No longer you need a small team of people in-house to make decision, but can leverage the ecosystem and outsource a lot of decision to your customers or the ecosystem at large. The second part is ubiquitous uh, computing power, the rising of computing power. So this is the rise of computing power. Notice on the y-axis, in fact, is the log scale. It's not even linear scale, so it's log scale. So at the turn of the century, back then, when IBM was building Turbulator, back in 1900, it's about the size of this room. If I map it to Animal Kingdom in terms of neural connection, it's as small as one single bacterium. That's how slow and clunky it is. Of course, computing power increased by changing from different fundamental technology, from vacuum tube to discrete transistor to integrated circuitry. So today, the high-end computer inside our laptop, for example, are close to a small mouse brain. And when you put a number of these CPU or GPU to do parallel calculation, magic can really happen. Which is why AI in the past sounds like science fiction. In the last five years, you have seen IBM Watson that can diagnose cancer. You have heard Google Duplex, some of you. 
can make telephone call to restaurant that human can no longer differentiate. At times, the computer sounds smarter than human even. And then you have AlphaGo that played the ancient board game, Chinese board game Go, and beat the world champion. All at a sudden, all this technological advancement becomes for real. And so what that all means is the internet that we know of are really moving to three phases. The first wave of the internet is really laying down the foundation. There's nothing more than having company like AOL, Cisco, and uh, Sun Microsystem lay down the foundation. What we are experiencing right now is really the tail end of the consumer-based internet. This is the world of Amazon, Google, Snapchat, Twitter, and Facebook, and so on. What we are observing and witnessing right now is the third wave of the internet. It's the kind of internet economy are creeping into historically highly regulated industries such as healthcare, highly consequential uh, domains such as aviation, transportation, energy, legal work, finance. In the past, you can have Mark Zuckerberg talking about move fast and break things. But imagine you're flying about 5,000 feet high on a plane. You want a jet engine to be made by GE or Rolls Royce, not branded by Snapchat. So the idea of just move fast and break things no longer suffice. In fact, what I would argue going forward is you see a lot of pioneering companies who's armed with historical know-how, but leap into new knowledge discipline, partnering with new startup together to reinvent the whole industry. Doesn't mean that industry historically are highly protected, won't be disrupted, it will. But no longer just disrupted by a single individual startup like the classic disruptive theory, but much more of a cross-boundary disruption. So I'll leave you for one final thought before we engage into a conversation as well. In the world of AI and connectivity, what we're seeing is, it's no longer just machine replacing muscle prowess, but it is also machine replacing human intelligence. In the past, every company need to make decision based on an internal small team of engineers, highly specialized, highly qualified, that they need to invent the world by themselves. Think about Xerox R&D Center. Think about IBM R&D Center back in the 60s. They're highly protected. The assumption is we know best, the best mind work for us. What we see today, of course, the innovation work become highly distributed, not just the iTunes, for example, the Apple, but if you're looking at companies such as Xiaomi, that most of the invention are built by their customers. So moving from a craftsmanship type of decision making into much more of a mass production type of decision making processes, highly distributed. And of course, with the emergence of AI, it's the final automation at the very top end. What that means is, as executive, we all have to understand what type of market activities and managerial decision would remain uniquely human. What type of decision you would completely turn over to machine in order to make sure your competitive advantage would still be there. But what type of decision you would continue to place human inside it to protect that empathy, that social networking, that human judgment to continue to play large. So I would call it the managerial creativity leap. I'll leave you with one final example. I was in Hangzhou to visit uh, Ann Financial, the financial arm of Alibaba. So they were expanding like crazy. Every 18 months, they doubled their revenue. And today, the market valuation of Ann Financial is larger than Goldman Sachs, by the way. It's rather phenomenal. So I talked to the head of HR there, and I asked, with your expansion, where do you find new talent? And he kind of looked at me funny, and he said, we never need to hire people. Our headcount remain the same. Because we simply automate everything of our mature business and redeploy everyone to new business development. And this is how they cap at about 7,000 people. As a result, you're looking at the revenue per employees is even higher than Goldman Sachs. Rather remarkable. And that's the power of AI in combination or managerial creativity. So with that, um, I'm going to pass to Vikram to have a bit of Q&A and challenge my thought together with que your question as well. Growing up in Hong Kong uh, influenced your worldview because Hong Kong is also a place that kept having to reinvent itself, right. kept having to leap, 
So could you tell us a little about how Hong Kong influenced your thinking? Yeah, I, I mean, I remember when I was growing up, Hong Kong, of course, as a light manufacturing sector, right? For the light manufacturing, we are the center. At one point, I think Hong Kong is the world number one toy exporter. Uh, surpassing Japan at one point in time. Textile is a huge thing. And my father is a mechanical engineer working for a soy source company. And then the whole manufacturing sector collapsed all of a sudden. All the job moves across China. And, and before I graduate in my college year, before we even get our first job, people were talking about reinventing ourselves. I was like, I haven't got my first job yet. Um, so that seems to be a perpetual worry for us Hong Kongers. That's decades before any American economist would thinking about, you know, low cost country would surpass the US one day. But in Hong Kong, it's always an era of distrust. So when I moved to Switzerland eight years ago, it startled me that, you know, in certain sector, even when you're a pioneer, you can stay on top of competition. A very different type of city dynamic in Basel compared with the type of city that I grew up with. And that's ultimately is sort of a personal thrust for me to write a book. Oh, right. So inspired by Hong Kong, that's interesting. One of the things that leaps out of your book is that technological sophistication is not a protection against copycats. You can be technologically very sophisticated. You can be a mobile phone maker. You can be a chip maker. You can make cars. Uh, you can make cameras. These are all quite high-tech things. And yet all of these things got copied and the incumbents got defeated. So it, it, this raises a couple of issues. One is that IP protection is overrated in today's world because as you say, a anybody can learn anything. People can learn, any anything can be learned, right? The second thing is what you said earlier, that it's good to be late. It's, uh, if you're a latecomer, you have an advantage. So the implication is that we should wait. We should not try to jump in to be the first. We should wait till somebody else does something and then we move in late and improve on it. Mm -hmm. is, would that be correct to say that? Yeah, absolutely. So there are two circumstances here. One is when the industry knowledge discipline stays stagnate, as I argue for automotive and PC and wind turbine, then latecomer always have a competitive advantage, right? Because IP one day will expire anyways. If you're looking at a drug industry, every time when a patent drug's gone off patent, then the revenue basically crumble. And so at some point, the IP protection will expire. And, and so the singular obsession around IP protection, I think, is a misguided industry policy. Now, however, for incumbent to leap, it's also very important to recognize what are the inevitable. I remember reading and looking at an interview by Steve Jobs. He said, in, even in the electronic industry, he said, this wave of technologies, you can see way before they come. They're actually quite slow. Now, if you jump to the wrong wave, you can actually waste a lot of energy and time and money. But if you serve on the right wave, then you can actually be very successful. And it takes years until it unfolds. And he was referring how he launched an iPod, in fact. Because the second coming of Steve Jobs, going back to Apple, and he was doing all this cost cutting and so on. And then there's a UCLA professor asking Steve Jobs, what are you going to do next? Now you have a turn around the company. And Steve Jobs smiled and said, I'm just going to wait. And turns out what he's been waiting for is the arrival of the broadband so that the downloading of music can become viable for him to launch the iTunes. And I thought that's a really interesting way of description because he's not the first comer for the MP3 player. He's actually the late comer, but he's the first one who get the experience right. Actually, a Singapore company came before him. It's creative. Creative, that's right. Right, right. We, we, I mean, creative created the first, I mean, one of the early MP3 players. And I have their sound card for my desktop PC, I remember. Really? Actually, Creative has come out with some very good speakers now. Yes. I mean, the, the, the latest, latest generation of Creative products. Uh, so they may be back, you know. But, um, but there's another, another insight that comes out of your, your work. And th that is that very, it, incumbents do not reinvent industries, typically. Mm. It's always a newcomer. 
if you look at any industry, you know, mobile phone, Nokia, I mean, um, it, it was reinvented not by Nokia, but by somebody, by Apple. Uh, you look at cameras, you mentioned uh, Kodak, and then reinvented by, by uh, Nikon and Canon, and then even other things, typewriters, they used to be Smith Corona and all that, and then it became my word, word, Microsoft Word. And in the middle, there was some company called Wang, microprocessor, you know, word processor. You look at the media industry, our own industry. I mean, it's being reinvented by Google and Facebook. They are, they are eating our lunch to some extent, right? <clears throat> so why is this? Why do the industry leaders not reinvent the industry? Why is it always someone from outside? Right or phrase it slightly differently, is why don't we see company or industry incumbent can leap more often, right? If, if companies across all industry leap just as ferociously as companies like Novartis and Roche, then company can stay on. And I think that comes down to the, the nature of managerial decision. Because every time when I, in my research, I saw that every time when a company leap, there is almost this confusive, compulsive fear around cannibalization. I'll give you a case in point. Because when, when P&G begins to leap into organic chemistry and in the wake of the launch of the Thai brand, they were so fearful that this synthetic detergent is going to destroy their natural soap business, the ivory brand. But then the chairman of the board basically said, if anybody is going to destroy our natural soap business, it better be P&G ourselves. That's exactly the same talk by Steve Jobs, right? He said, if we don't cannibalize ourselves, somebody else would. And the nice thing is across history, for a company to successfully leap, it cannot be guided just purely by financial payback and analysis on Excel spreadsheet. It has to develop a shared agenda so that the whole top management team can guide that man, man, uh, investment decision to navigate this very complex situation. Otherwise, we just listen to Wall Street what we should do. I hope there's no Wall Street bankers here. But we, we need to reinvent investment banking too. <laughs> Let me ask you this. I mean, what if there is a company which has an existing product which is very profitable still, yeah. right? But it can see that it's not the future. Mm -hmm. The future is going to be something else that is visible. So, for example, take Kodak. They were making film. They were actually doing quite well yeah. until the late 90s. Right. And then some guy comes to the CEO's office and says, look, I've got this new thing. It's a digital camera. And I don't know what the CEO exactly said, but the story is the CEO said, oh, that's cute, but don't tell anybody, right? So what, so what would you do? What if you're the CEO of Kodak and this employee comes to you and says, I've got this new, yeah. new thing. How would you deal with it? And you're still making a lot of money yeah. on film. That's right. So what, what's your advice? Yeah. So, um there are two parts of this question. In fact, uh, at IMD, we kind of go through Kodak history just to looking at from a financial analysis angle, what buys the company, right? So what we saw is from, 19, uh, from the early 90s all the way to early 2000, what you see is the, uh, the conventional film grow linearly. So as digital, by the way, the digital grow nicely on top linearly. So if you are a business executive by early 2000, people ask you how you're gonna grow your business, you probably say conventional film is growing steadily, we need to protect, extend, and strengthen. Digital continue to grow faster and faster, we need to double down. But what happened after two, 2000, it actually goes like this. The conventional film plummeted overnight. So here's the thing, disruptive innovation rarely process or progress linearly. They always hit a tipping point, then the paradigm completely shift. So as pharmaceutical industry, right? The sort of bioinformatics, genetic R&D is sort of like a nice thing to play around. And then all of a sudden it flip, then the biotech becomes the growth engine for all pharmaceutical industry. So at Novartis, compare and contrast to uh, Kodak, the CEO Daniel uh, Vonsella, who saw the first 
drugs based on DNA genetics methodologies called cleaving, it's a targeted drugs, that can solve a very tiny population of rare form of leukemia. So he was looking at the evidence, right? Most managers said we should let go. This is just a toy. If we go down to the FDA approval, it's gonna cost us a lot of money, but it only serve a very small, tiny population of the patient. But uh, Daniel basically said, if this drug is not, it's gonna change the way we discover drugs going forward. It's no longer just about incremental revenue. In this case, if it's gonna change the way we discover drugs going forward, money doesn't matter, that's what he said. Full steam ahead. So I think this is a nice compare and contrast when if we make decision only based on historical result and financial analysis, it's almost like driving a car, looking at the rear back mirror. So in a way that when we confront it with disruption, when we need to leap, it really requires a top team of general manager to come together to develop point of view about the future, to make trade off today, to accountable for that, that foreseeable future. I think this, uh, this leads into one of the audience questions, uh, which, uh, which is this. Okay, for a company to leap, it is dependent on determination and alignment of vision beyond the single leader. So what can we do to align leaders, yeah. align basically the managers and the CEO? Yeah, uh, um, yeah. so, so I, I, in my personal observation, company running into trouble of not able to resolve this top team alignment, usually because the discussions only discuss about strategy. Now if you think about LEAP, it really required a company to stomach in cannibalization you know, taking a sort of a profit hit, it will have consequences to one of the top team leader for sure. Someone is gonna run a major business. So unless there is a strong sense of psychological safety, unless there is a strong unity at the top team, and seeing each other, so I'm the manufacturing guy, you're the marketing guy, usually we hate each other, right? So we need to resolve those personal issues and we see each other eye to eye. Um, unless we arrive at that stage, it's really difficult to execute the strategy to move the company forward. And, and quite frankly, this is, uh, you know, sometimes it requires external facilitators. Sometimes I've seen even putting in a clinical psychologist to work through some of the personal trauma in the past during their career um, because everybody is taking huge risk at their stage and it's no longer just strategy or it's not just strategic acumen, but a lot to do with personal leadership. So it's an integrated view of what business leader is about, ultimately, is the calling. Um, you just mentioned um, the, the role of the CEO in the case of Novartis. He played a critical role. He, he actually came and said, money doesn't matter, mm -hmm. we just have to do this. I think in your book also you, you talk about the role of the CEO. I think conventionally we, we often think that the CEO's role is basically to set strategy, mm -hmm. right? But I think you say in your book uh, and you imply in, your, in, 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 in what you just said that it needs to be more than that. There are times when the CEO needs to actually get his or her hands dirty. Mm -hmm. They need to... Um, actually get involved in the innovation process. You also say they need to take, absorb the risks, the career risks of other people. Because if you're, if you're a manager and somebody comes to you with a new idea, if you say yes and the idea does well, you'll probably get a bonus. If you say no, uh, or if, you say, if, if, you, if you say yes and the idea fails, you'll probably get fired, mm -hmm. right? So it's better to say no. Right. So in this situation, the CEO, you, you argue in your book that the CEO must step, step up and, and absorb that risk that the, the manager is not willing to take. So, yeah, so what, what should a CEO be doing beyond setting strategy? Yeah. What should be the role of the CEO? Yeah. So I'm not saying the CEO would know everything, right? Because as wise as Steve Jobs himself, he's not the one who pushed for the iPhone. He's one of his uh, direct report who keep on arguing with him and pushed him to launch the iPhone. In fact, all the multi-touch technology he claimed on the stage, he invented it. None of those are invented by him. It's documented by the book called One Device. And I thought it's really interesting. 
Now, there are two parts here. One is, of course, the organization must set up the right climate and the right organizational structure so that the company can embrace a lot of experimentation because no one knows what would work out. And there are so much unknown out there that they have to do a lot of market experimentation based on evidence, then finally the company can make the right call uh, rather than you know, kind of hippo, the highest paying person opinion in the room, right? You want actually based on evidence to make those decisions. However, the CEO role comes into play once the evidence becomes very clear. You actually need to channel resources, oftentimes from the old business to the new. And that is something that a top team cannot delegate to general manager. We can delegate and ask general manager to embrace risk taking, doing innovation, to collaborate, doing partnership. These are all well and must do because CEO is not omnipotent. But what the CEO and his top team must do is to, once the evidence become clear, to move from an emerging strategy into deliberate mode, that pull of trigger is something that no one else can, 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 can delegate. Yeah. Right. There's another audience question which has uh, quite a few votes, and it goes like this. For very traditional organizations, how can you stimulate people to be innovative and disruptive? Imagine a very traditional company, Absolutely. which is not a, does not have an innovation culture, right. it's just a normal company. Yeah, so and, and I think this is a great question because no matter what kind of functions and level of a manager, uh, you want to keep yourself to be the cutting edge uh, for a very simple reason because, you know, 50 years ago, the lifespan of a four, uh, S&P 500 is about 60 years, similar time length of a human being. Today is around 15 years, one five. So, so particularly for the millennial, they fully knowing the company I joined today will not last until I retired. So that's the brutality of global competition, right? As a result, everyone needs to stay on top of the labor market competition. Now, I see executives who can contribute most to their organization are usually intensively curious meaning they may come from an oil and gas industry, but they are so curious about FMCG, fast consumer goods industry. How do they do business? How do they reinvent themselves? Not to copy anything wholesale, but by studying how business model happen across the world, across sector, then they can selectively, selectively pick the best element to apply to their own circumstances. So I think the first most salient observation I have for successful innovator, regardless of functions and level, they're deeply curious around the world. Um, just being aware of what causes what and why. When there's a best practice being told by BCG or McKinsey, they kind of take a step back and try to say, under what circumstances these best practices actually would apply, rather than copy that practice wholesale. So the two things, right? Critical thinking as well as intensely curious, I think is the hallmark for successful innovator in, in today's day and age. Right. Um, <clears throat> but innovating and making the leap, as you say, that sounds, it seems pretty rare. It's not, most companies don't, mm -hmm. don't, don't make it. So what is, what do you suggest as a strategy for doing this? Uh, should, you, should, should they set up a kind of skunk works in a different location? Like Shenzhen, you know, they set up a skunk works in Guangdong because they are based in Shenzhen. Or IBM set up a skunk works in Florida, yeah. right? So, I mean, that is a strategy. And you put some very smart people there and you give them some money and you give them some machines and say, get on with it and let's see what happens. Is that, is that the way? Or is it about empowering people at the lower level, lower level at all lower levels to somehow be involved in creating change. Yeah. What is, uh, or is there some third way? Yeah, so depending what the company want to achieve, I think the skunk work methodology is really powerful when the company want to incubate a new business unit that embrace a new disruptive model. So there are 25 years of research that support that element. But what we're seeing today, there's also and other type of the puzzle that big company need to embrace. For, take AI, for example, or business analytics. Really, it's no matter what kind of functional business area, you've got to embrace AI. 
um, because I've seen statistics that right now we're really entering the age of corporate inequality. So let's say manufacturing. Company that can embrace AI and advanced automation, they see their productivity per employee basically shot up. Company that don't do that, productivity decline. Same thing for service industry. If you're a bank, right? like DBS, very advanced in blockchain and digitization, they really see their productivity per employee shot up. Other banks that are more conservative and don't embrace these technologies, they see their productivity per employee plummeted. Why? Because customer expectation gone up, and if you need to throw in human hands, your cost structure are in big trouble. So in this situation, when the capability must be applied across, setting up skunk work is no longer sufficient. You actually need to run many, many workshops to get all the manager to be excited and, and show but don't tell. Do not impose, but unleash the innovation power across so that even the factory guy begins to think about how can I apply uh, augmented reality into the factory setting so that my colleagues can do that operation more precisely, the training time is lower, which is in fact what I've seen at Mars Confectionery in Chicago of an employee on the shop floor to embrace these type of innovation thinking. So I think because the world is moving so fast these days, scum work historically worked very well for Lockheed Martin 30 years ago. Today, it's not even quick enough. Okay. That's it's a strong statement, though. Yeah, <laughs> fascinating. It was a time when Intel was unassailable, when Nokia was unassailable. It was the undisputed leader. Blockbuster was, you know, the the blockbuster company, uh, Xerox, was unassailable. Oh, that's what we thought, I mean, at that, that, that time. But all of these guys fell by the wayside. Now we have a new group of unassailables, the fangs, what we call yeah. them. Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Google. Do you, do you think these people are, and uh, they're all platform companies, do you think they're unassailable? So my take is twofold. Um, the historical core businesses based on consumer internet, such as Google on search or Twitter on microblogging or Facebook on social networking, they still are okay. But the new type of growth they're trying to enter in is not as straightforward as they thought in the past. You're looking at Waymo by Google, right? They've been spending years in advance ahead of Daimler and BMW and everybody trying to get autonomous driving on the road. Almost close to 10 years now is still struggling. Why? Because building a car, in fact, is quite difficult. It's not as easy. And last but not the least, because for Waymo to be successful, their product cannot fail fast to succeed early. The moment you put a car on the road, it needs to be safe. Period. And so the bar for innovation is actually very, very high. Unlike in the past when Google first started off with search engine, they are competing with no alternative. There's nothing really viable. You basically competing with Yahoo and all these guys. But now Waymo is competing with Daimler, who also have their autonomous vehicle division based in Silicon Valley. So it becomes a race where the Silicon Valley can invo invade Detroit faster or Detroit becomes Silicon Valley faster. So I think in the consumer based internet, these fan guy still have a good platform because they're the largest and the network effect reinforce that winning element. But all this peripheral growth that they're so desperate to getting into because their valuation is very high is in fact not as easy as they thought. There's a related question uh, from somebody in the audience. Do you think in future every industry will have only one or two big players who dominate? Yeah. yeah. And what, would, what advice would you give to number right. three, four, right. and five? Right, right. So this is really important, I think. Um, there are two parts we have to come to grip. Um, yes, so, so, so if you're looking at the reason why, let me put it this way. If you're looking at the FANG, Google, except for China, they really dominate search. Uh, Facebook, again, dominates social networking. Now, China is exceptional because they have the great firewall that, you know, bar out anybody else. Um, but in, in this type of new economy, uh, economists always call there's a network effect, meaning the big would have, would have this winner-take-all 
effect because once everybody is on Facebook, no one is going to shift to another platform. It just makes no sense. Um, the implication becomes, remember I mentioned about the third wave of the internet? We already see company are entering that space. So let's take Medtronics, the hard pacemaker uh, based in Ohio. So they make hard pacemaker. And, and they really thought they need to embrace the third wave of the internet. So they put a lot of embedded sensor onto the hard pacemaker. Linking doctors on one end, so they beam do uh, patient data to doctors 24 hours a day. And they link patient on the other side. You kind of wonder why they, do th they need to do that. Well, they want to become a platform, just like Facebook, linking doctors and patient. John Deere is another interesting example. They make tractor. So they are competing very ferociously against a low-cost competition from India, Mahindra Mahindra. So over the years, what John Deere have done, they put in a lot of embedded sensor into the tractor, build up a platform called My John Deere, so that to tell farmers how to carry out precision farming linking weather forecast data, they have sensor to, so they know the soil composition. And on the other side, they link in fertilizer manufacturer, Dow Chemicals, Sangenta, Monsanto, and so on. So again, linking farmers and fertilizer on a platform. Now, because the platform always have this winner-take-all element, which means that even in these highly regulated industry, there would still be sort of a Google effect, except it would be confined within the chosen domain. Meaning, if John Deere one day becomes the largest platform in farming equipment, that would be it. If Medtronics becomes the largest hard pace maker in that sector, that would be it. Because the platform dynamic really reinforced winner take all, which would be very different than the past. In the past, you have PepsiCo competing with Coca-Cola, competing with Nestle, competing with P&G, and then Unilever. It's oligopoly. In the future, each sector would go very deep, but, e but still would have a bit more on a, of a monopolistic uh, element around. It's just inevitable. So the, what advice would you give to number three, four, and five? <laughs> As the question says, just do something else. <laughs> Now, the good news right now is if you're looking at the third wave of the internet, it's still unclear who's becoming, who will become the dominant player. So the game is still on. If you're looking from cars, if you're looking at aviation, everybody's raising there. So as a professor of innovation, of course, I would say innovation is best to do it today. Um, but putting that aside, um, if you are, so you're looking at the automotive industry, right? The second tier of automaker like Porsche or Citroen or Honda are really under pressure today because if autonomous vehicle becomes reality soon, electric vehicle is gonna become reality soon and sharing economy is already here, the number of car required by the society will simply drop. There will be industry consolidation, even for business school, right? Um, I was reading some report, the application for MBA, even in the United States, including Harvard Business School, have experienced year by year decline at around 7%. So Harvard Business School, of course, would be the last one who feel the pain. But you can imagine all these schools in the mid-level are really subject to a lot of tremendous pressure. So industry consolidation. So where are the students going then? They're going to... Oh. <laughs> I think that's MOOC, right? The online learning is, 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 is exerting a lot of substitutional effect. Uh, Singularity University, this unconventional pri provider, uh, uh, exerting a lot of pressure. And with the rise of AI, um, some people may choose to go for hard science instead of going to a business school. So as a result, the industry as a whole uh, experienced quite a bit of pressure. And of course, then at business school, we have our old business model, tenure professor, so it's going to be a chaos. Okay. <laughs> okay. So that's, that's really interesting because um, from Volvo to Daimler, what I've seen, they are really running experiment like crazy. All of a sudden, these German engineers seem to embrace the Silicon Valley model. So, so I saw in Daimler in Chicago, they actually have launched a nationwide initiative called car to go so some of you may have heard about Zipcar in the United States where you rent your car and unlock the car 
But those zip cars usually park in the designated area. So Mercedes-Benz took that idea to the next level. They basically flood Chicago, the city, with lots of Mercedes-Benz around, and you have a mobile app, you beep, and then you can go in and charge by the hours. And that's Mercedes-Benz, right? They call it car to go. Volvo from Sweden, similarly, they have launched something called a subscription model. It's not leasing model. If you lease a car, you still need to do your insurance and maintenance and oil change. Uh, Care by Volvo is truly like Netflix, that you pay for monthly subscription, Every year you can change the car. The insurance policy taken care by Volvo. So they really experiment with new business model. And so I think finally this automaker are really waking up. Now I think they are very lucky because Tesla is under a, quite a bit of crisis right now. So they have some breathing space to catch up. And, 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 and you see there are two modes of operation. One is they will invest huge amount of R&D in autopilot these days to, to really catch up. And I think they are able, if they want, they, they will be able to catch up because autonomous driving, there are five levels. All industry experts right now are talking about, we are still at the number level three. So if they're really pouring their, 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 their resources and determination in, the game is not predetermined yet. So it's a really interesting uh, situation to watch, but no doubt, Experimentation in the marketplace is absolutely critical, and you begin to see one or two of these top tier player begins to wake up in a very massive way. So it's interesting. That means in this case, it's not clear that the newcomer will win. It really it is may not, it's be not clear. clear yet. Yeah? Um, again, I think the automakers are drawing analogy and understanding from another industry. You're looking at personal computer, right? Lenovo or HP or Dell never makes money. It's the Microsoft, it's Intel that makes money, the key component. And I think the Daimler guy understand that if we don't build our auto driving by ourselves and let Google Waymo to take it over, they would become the OEM of PC but for car. They make the dumb metal box and no one wants to do that. And so it's again, learning from other industries is so valuable, right? Because it predicts what kind of industry dynamic you're going to head into. And when time is still on your side, you can change the way of how the history is going to unfold in the future. Right. Another question from the audience um, on SMEs. SMEs, we have a lot of SMEs in Singapore. Right. Uh, and some of the complaints about SMEs are that they lack scale. Mm -hmm. They don't have scale. So some people criticize the government for pampering MNCs because MNCs have scale, SMEs have no scale. So the question is, is, is scale a problem? Or, and, and do, you, do you have anything, any stories that can in, inspire SMEs? Yeah, so, so I think, you know, if you're looking at small, medium-sized enterprise, the, the the strategic advantage is always around the agility because the number of employee tend to be smaller, the top management team are more closely needed, so they could move faster than a large established company with board members and so on. Um, so for SME to unleash that advantage, I think we have to really think it through around ubiquitous connectivity. Because in the past, if you want to do something, you need to build it in-house because you cannot rely on external provider. There's just too much coordination you need to work across. Mm -hmm. But what we're seeing today is, of course, connecting across organization becomes more far easier through open source, through API, through blockchain, near future. So for SME, really need to think it through how can we leverage the ecosystem around for you as SME to even enter the uh, foreign market as well. I've seen many examples in Switzerland, for example, that these Swiss companies are having, well, you know, based in Lugano, the Italian side of Switzerland, that no one would go. It would take me four hours to go down that part of Switzerland. Um, but they will export big time to China for high-end machine. And, and the way they do it is the Swiss government are quite obsessed about the Chinese uh, export market. So they have Swiss Center, the Chamber of Commerce, to basically build a Swiss ecosystem as a portal for SME to plug and play. Um, this is just one of the many modes, but I think the consistent theme is how can small company can leverage their agility to really uh, connect rather than build it in-house in that regard. 
related to that, this is something intriguing that you say in your book. You have this statement which says, big companies should act small. Mm. What do you mean by that? Yeah. So, two parts. One is this idea of embrace experimentation. Really, sometimes, at, at times, we simply, simply need to budget in certain resources for market experimentation. The paradox about Kodak, the paradox even including Polaroid, is these guys are so happy to throw in millions of dollars inside the four walls of R&D. They were happy to spend billions of dollars as long as inside the laboratory. But they weren't even willing to spend 10,000 in the marketplace for experimentation of a new business model. And that's always been the historical paradox. So when I say big companies need to act like small, is essentially let's take a, 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 a part of your revenue and just put it as market transaction test. If you launch a product, if it fails, so what? You learn a great deal. And don't find a failed manager because they know you pay for the tuition. So, so it's this idea that we need to learn from the market, particularly when we enter adjacency, because we don't know what we don't know. Um, so one company I came across lately is called a Swiss Post, the postal office in Switzerland. And they are now, they had autonomous delivery robots. They have drone delivering medical supply across hospital. They have autonomous bus because they run, run the bus company as well. So I, I was perplexed. How could a postal office do all that? And they had something called early label. Early label, early label. meaning these early label product, they basically tell the general public, we may discontinue all at a sudden. The functionality may not be perfect, but this is how we learn from the marketplace. So they display everything. So even a postal office is really embracing this idea of prototyping. So I think we could use that as a positive example for big company to learn. If a Swiss postal office are embracing experimentation, there's really no excuse for us not to do so. Right. But uh, experimentation, I know a lot of management gurus advocate this, but experimentation is expensive. Experimentation can lead to failures. Um, so is, is, it really, is, is it really essential to keep experimenting? Well, if the business landscape stays stagnant and stable, then there's really no need. Because you know so much you can do big bang in a new product launch. But in an environment, being shifted by connectivity and AI, there's so much that we don't know, then it's too risky to do Big Bang. In fact, Jeff Bezos from Amazon always say, you know, the biggest problem for big companies is they wait for too long, and towards the end of their corporate existence, the only option they have is left for a Hail Mary bat. American football, you pray for the best and throw in the last shot, that's called Hail Mary bat. You're betting the house. Very, yeah. Exactly. So inaction and lack of experimentation, I would argue, is the highest risk. Right. There's a, okay, the self-interested question here coming from someone from my industry. Okay, is this leap that you talk about possible in all industries? How can traditional media like newspapers and TV, where should they leap? Yeah, so, so, so there, is, there, there is part of a tragedy in the past and there is new hope going forward. The tragedy, I think, is the newspaper sec sector from Singapore to worldwide. It really is a worldwide phenomenon. We listen to the Facebook gospel too much. And of course, Facebook and Google, their only goal is to commoditize news content. It's in their favor. And somehow, Newspaper, publisher, and even academia, like me, we sort of listened to that gospel for too long and thought this is the ultimate truth. But turns out, if you have great content, people are willing to pay. You're looking at the New York Times subscription over the last 18 months, people actually pay for good content. New Yorkers see their surge in terms of subscription, and, 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 and then newspaper begins to put on more and more paywall with positive result. And in fact, people begin to challenge that free content may not be the right approach. The reason that we can get access of free content is because of advertisement. And I think there's a backlash against advertising model these days. Because if you only rely on advertisement, your end users is never your customer. 
They're simply product to sell back to advertiser. So there's a societal backlash against the Facebook and Google model. That's number one. Second is for newspaper to move forward, I think company newspaper can embrace different model. One is the New York Times model, right? You, you build really high-end content or specialize in local news because we, in fact, lack local news these days. Everyone talking about Trump, but who cares if you're in Singapore, right? But, but here is a community really need this course about the local news. And, and in, across America, this, this you know, dying of local newspaper is really causing societal problem at large. So I think it's high content. Specialization is one playbook. The second playbook is you could play open innovation at the extreme. So in terms of magazine in the United States, you have Fortune and Wire that write article by internal staff writer. And then you have Forbes, Forbes magazine, that basically have thousands of subject expert that contribute article, that I am one of them, and I can write article and publish anytime I want. The result is Forbes got so much content covering so many areas that no magazine can rival. So that's number two. The third one is automation. A social press, for example, they automate article by robots, right? So 3,000 articles per quarter we read these days are written by robots. So, so different strategy. I think the newspaper industry uh, are really diverging. But you know, staying from what we do best in the past is no longer an option. Getting stuck in the middle is dangerous. This is a matter of interest, uh, Howard. What newspapers do you read? <laughs> I still read my New York Times. Oh, you don't Times. read newspapers? <laughs> I still read my New York Times. You read your New York Times. OK. I think you mentioned something interesting about the, the Forbes model. This is crowdsourcing. Yeah. Content. I think there's another, that's another theme you explore in your book. Uh, actually, you mentioned it also in your talk, uh, WeChat. Yeah. Uh, that that the, the, some of the best innovations do not come from the company that created the product. Some of the best innovations on the iPhone have not come from Apple. Yeah. They have come from like Uber or whoever. Snapchat. Right? Snapchat, whoever. So is this something that companies should look at? Yeah. Sort of crowdsourcing uh, content or uh, crowdsourcing value added yeah. from the outside world. Yeah, um, yes. And once you put on that lens, then the role of a company or product manager radically shift. So the reason that WeChat can grow so big is, of course, in China, you have to use WeChat from payment to booking hotel to visiting doctors, everything into WeChat. I remember I was in Shanghai walking around People's Park and there are homeless people asking for money. They weren't asking for change. They hold up the QR code and ask for donation on <laughs> mobile payment. So in China, the bag has gone digital, right? Um, so the reason that WeChat can be so powerful, I think fundamentally, is they link a lot of service provider on one side and customer on the other side. So they, they, they never invent a banking function, right? Is China Merchant Bank. They never come up with a function to book airline. Is South, Southwest Airline. So everything that they do is to partner with big brand in phase one. Phase two, then they develop what they call a mini program to enable sort of a mom and pop store, the low end of the market that guys don't have IT department, but can learn how to program a WeChat mini program to provide their services to the end user base much quicker. So basically over weekend, people like you and I can write a mini program on WeChat. The reason they do that is so that they can have as many services as possible. If you think for a moment, then WeChat category manager or product manager is around the development of toolkit to enable the ecosystem to innovate. It's not coming up with product features. So if once you move into that mindset, then the role of product manager really radical shift is about enabling the ecosystem rather than developing something ingenious features anymore. But since we're on WeChat, one of the things about WeChat is they don't store much data, mm. right? Isn't that strange? It is very strange, right? Because I remember, you know, uh, from Amazon to Google to Facebook, yeah. storing data, but data mining is king. So, of course, today WeChat were forced to store seven days of data because of Chinese government regulation. Um, but historically, they were 
only storing two days. I was surprised, and I, wasn't I, I didn't believe them, right? So when I was writing the case, I asked the guy, could you walk me around the service room? So I count the number of feet in the service room and send in the square, the area, to my friend at EPFL and do a backward calculation based on the user base. And yes, they only store two days of data. So I asked them, why, why don't you guys store data? And they said, well, you know, in China, if you store data, <laughs> <laughs> People are going to ask for access, and they just don't want to get into that part of the business. As a result, Western brands such as Starbucks uh, or McDonald's or Bank of America, because they don't store data, they only provide connectivity through API, like Pi in between, then it becomes quite a feasible method, because Bank of America would never thought or never would imagine to partner with Facebook. For you and I to check our banking account through Facebook portal, that wouldn't be OK. But on WeChat, that's kind of OK, because it simply provides API. All the calculation and computing power, as well as customer data, reside on the bank itself. So all of a sudden, WeChat have a complete different value proposition. We simply connect you with our millions, or 1 million or 1.5 million user base, and we have an interface that the millennial would like, and then for bank, all of a sudden, yeah, we can never build a user interface that are so attractive to the millennial, and, and why not just plug and play? So in the Western world, among telecom providers, thumb pie is the taboo, right? You want to add value. For WeChat, they want to be the biggest thumb pie in the world, and that's kind of interesting. That's, yeah, that's, that's very interesting, because uh, yeah, we all thought data was a new oil, and we must all collect lots of data. But speaking of that, I mean, Singapore, we are a small country. Yeah. We, don't, uh, we can never collect as much data as, for example, China. So does that put us at a disadvantage in terms of you know, developing AI? And so, because for AI, you need data. You need algorithms, and you need lots of data. Yeah. So is, is that a great disadvantage? That's interesting, because I talk to a lot of different country, particularly on a policymaker, um, because the race of AI is really real. and that tip the nation's competitive advantage. And I think it's, it's this idea that nations need to specialize, right? So this is an old idea by Michael Porter, that country that command competitive advantage, they need to specialize to have an industry cluster, which is why you see different areas, of, for example, historically in Japan, is automotive is a cluster, because you need all these component parts applied to work together. Same thing for AI, there are so many applications. So I'll give you an example. In, in, in Europe, because of the tight regulation on consumer, uh, consumer data called GDPR just got rolled out across Europe, cybersecurity is always a big concern. Those would be the application that Europe can specialize. And I think Singapore would be worthwhile to think, figure out what type of AI-related sector that we could specialize. I see finance can be very viable, in fact and you see some edge in that domain. Um, so, so it's not doing everything, because after all, AI is really the general purpose technologies. It's a steam engine for the 21st century. There's so many applications. But by specializing in certain cluster, that can then allow a, a, a nation to stay competitive. Right. Um, yeah, somebody wants to know how the government, what role the government can have in enabling innovation. Yeah. What should a government do? If you're advising the Singapore government, yeah. what would you tell them? Yeah. <laughs> so in my observation, it comes down to two, two parts. The first part is, uh, no matter whether the, the, the country is small or big, uh, no country can stay prosperous for a long time, only relying on SME. At some point, you do need multinational to have huge export volume, to push the nation in terms of prosperity on a sustainable basis. I mentioned this because you're looking at Switzerland, tiny country, seven million people. You have Novartis, you have Roche, you have ABB, you have Credit Suisse, you have UBS, huge multinational. Same thing in Denmark, tiny country. You have Maersk, you have Novo Nordisk, all these Lego, all these multinational. Japan, same thing, South Korea, same thing. So, even for small nations, you do need big multinational to have that scale to generate uh, GDP growth. The second part is 
the domicile of the multinational also matter. Some nation would say we just open door having multinational from overseas and come in and that's okay. But if I'm looking at the most value at the most critical activity of multinational, they always stay at their home country. Take semiconductor industry as an example. Intel have factory around the world. The latest technology is always in California. TSMC have factory across China. The latest technology is always in Taiwan. Uh, you know, same thing as Samsung, it's always in South Korea. Um, and so the most value add activities for a multinational always reside on the domicile. So the identity of a multinational does matter. It's not open door. Now the third thing is, once we have big multinational, then the government actually needs to make sure there's a vital venture capital industry to incubate the next wave of disruptor. Think about Japan. When Honda, Toyota, along with NEC and Sony grow big, they really disrupt the world. As a result, Japan grew rich. But they lack the venture capital industry, so all these companies grow up big, disrupt the world once, and then they stay stagnate. Compare and contrast with the US, when RCA, Kodak all gone down the drain, then you have the Silicon Valley, uh, you know, upstart to, to continue to rejuvenate the industry. So, so both encouraging big firm with export target to make sure they have the motivation to grow big internationally, at the same time incubate the next wave of disruptor to keep the big guy to work harder. We are all human, right? Yep. Yeah. I hope somebody from the government is here. No? <laughs> Listen to that. Um, there's another question from the audience got the most amount of votes so far. Uh, it's about the gig economy. Um, what role will the gig economy have in building and retaining the cutting edge? Yeah, so, so gig economy or sharing economy in general really came about because of ubiquitous connectivity. Um, so, so in the past, gig economy really reside on the manual, repetitive tasks like Uber or Airbnb. But what we see more and more is gig economy also entering the space of creative industry. So no longer for, for, from professional photography to creative advertisement, all of these can be pretty much crowdsourced these days to website development. So I think it is important that this gig economy powered by connectivity is allowing individual to do more creative work at much lower cost level. But there is also a dark side of it because without a good societal safety net, people engaged in the gig economy hardly can make a decent living with the lack of health insurance and benefits and, and decent pay. Because in the past, the way we conceptualize gig economy is substitutional income. I do it on part time. So on weekend, I drive my Uber so that I can buy a Louis Vuitton. But then if the whole big swath of the population are engaged in a gig economy, then we have to reimagine how our societal contracting can work. Otherwise, we would get into a really desperate situation, left with a handful of platform players who capture all the value, which is not good. Yeah. So it's also there's a, lot, a lot of job insecurity, and then it That's has right. the implications for even the housing market, how do people service mortgages? If you, know, you don't have a steady job, you may have a job this week, but may not have next week. How do you buy a house? How do you, you know, all those, they've got to sort, sort all those things out. Yeah. Another thing you, you talk a lot about is that these new frontiers, the, the uh, seismic shifts, as you put it. There's AI, there's IoT, there's sensors, there's data, there's blockchain. All of these things are happening all at the same time. They're all coming at us. So, two questions. One is, how should we respond as workers? Um, and second is, yeah, I mean, what kind of career advice would you give to somebody who's maybe faced with being uh, made obsolete by AI? Right, so, so I think for the millennial to begin with, um, or, 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 or the more junior or, or high potential, um, they have to really staring at the kind of job function they are entering 
how likely in the next five years how that job nature is going to change. Meaning within that job description that they are having right now, in the next five years, how much it is going to turn over to machine entirely. How much it would stay to continue to be more human related. I'll give you a very concrete example. So I was in New York and, 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 and listening to a talk by a celebrated surgeon called Atu Gawati who wrote the book uh, Checklist Manifesto, who's also a New Yorker staff writer as well, and also a surgeon in Mass General Hospital. I don't know how he does all that. But he was talking about the change of healthcare in the United States. In, and in the audience, there's one guy said, raised his hand. How's AI going to change you, right? Because AI, like IBM Watson on health oncology, these days can arrive diagnosis for lung cancer. You know, radiologists, their job is no longer getting displaced by India anymore, but in fact, it's AI is back, backing in, but it's simply replaced by robot. But then Atu Gawadi has an interesting statement. He said, well, you know, if a patient comes in and says, I have pain here, you as a doctor still need to ask, wait, is it your rib cage? Is it your stomach? Uh, what did you eat yesterday? Uh, what is your dietary habit? That conversation, as much as like a detective, as well as a doctor, you need to build that empathy, trust, solidarity, right? You basically ask someone to undress and you might cut him open. And so in healthcare, and he said, well, you know, there are many AI systems, but whether I'm going to use an AI system for liver or whether I'm going to use for AI system for lung, someone still need to make that decision. And so, in a broad picture, I think the managerial decision remain to be human is integration of different knowledge domain. The kind of expert domain, unless it's really cutting edge, will get automated, no matter what, because that is how we get the cost structure right. What we human manager can work better is to integrate different domain of knowledge, and those are social networking, coaching, we continue to be uniquely human. So play around those value add. So there are certain things that just will not be disrupted, no, certain jobs that will remain. That will remain, but also uh, we need to regain control of our own agenda. Think about your work day. When you go back to the office, you get flooded by email. Everything you do is kind of reroute the email to someone else. We, in fact, turn into reduced to human router. The value add we add on to our work is minuscule. And that is so dangerous, right? It's so easy to replace by a bulk. I think what we need to do is to block chunk of time so that you can really add creative work deeply, hours using your creative thinking. Those are less likely to be replaced by a robot, which means that we need to really take hold of our own agenda and doing deep work, which is, of course, easy to be said than done. But that is ultimately how the daily habit can buffer us from being replaced by a robot. I just love this question, so I'm going to put it up. It's it, it's uh, such an unusual question. So, okay. It says strong leaders are needed for a company to leap, but in large companies, a conservative board of directors can be a hindrance. <laughs> <laughs> so, can you replace the board with AI? <laughs> that would be a good idea. That's a good idea, right? <laughs> and uh, let the leap execution be done by managers. Uh, I don't know who asked that. Brilliant question. Thank you. It, it, it's kind of interesting dynamic because oftentimes when we seek innovation, the general manager would say the CEO said no, and then the CEO said would the board say no, and the board say the financial market say no. And there seems to be a systemic victimization uh, going on. Um, no, but okay, let, let's, let's, uh, let's take the, the funny part out, and let's just say that you have a cons company with a very conservative board. What do you do? What can, what can managers do? What would you recommend? So there are times that I really have seen this happen, right? Um, it does require first is um, two parts. One is, you know, the, 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 the top management team first need to have a very strong share point of view. It cannot be just a CEO go to the board and the rest of the team members are not on board. Once the whole top team have a shared point of view, then the board is really a governance structure. They are there to give guidance and governance. Second part is evidence. 
if the top management team want to leap into a certain direction, it must be guided with early evidence based on market transaction tests we earlier talking about, based on the inevitable trend that you have already foreseen. And quite frankly, board members usually are sitting across board. They are actually smart people. With evidence, with a bit of coaching on storytelling perhaps, I have seen company actually can persuade not just the board but even the financial market to really award those innovation. Case in point, in, in, in Europe there is a big company called Securitas. They do armory, right, uh, for, for, for cash transaction across bank. They really know that business is going to get disrupted. They really come up with an alternative strategy. The board doesn't like it and they do a lot of experimentation with early evidence. On the day they announced a strategy in front of Wall Street, their stock price actually went up for 4%. The way they do it is the CEO together with the CFO, together with the whole team, they stood in front of the investor you know, hearing, and they can all have a consistent rationale behind across all activities. So, so it is doable, and, but it's hard work. It really is hard work. Um, I, you know, I, I know I've been taking questions from the iPad, but it, would anybody like to ask a question in person? Yes, sir. Hi, uh, this is uh, Dr. Patrick Liu, uh, Chairman of China Achievement Singapore. Uh, our charity focuses on training uh, young people uh, to work on the 21st century skills. Uh, uh, most of our education system is based on economy on zero. Mm -hmm. What would you suggest on how we can train our students so that they can be ready for the new uh, era, the new world disorder? Yeah, so m most impeding, I think, you know, we all kind of in the audience, we grew up from the era of Excel spreadsheet. I think um, software programming is almost the future language of business. You know, if we are millennial, you have to learn that. I, I mean, learning Python is not that difficult these days. And even at IMD, our MBA curriculum, we now have digital boot camp. So some of these are really basic skill for the, uh, you know, for the next five years. We just need to eat the bullet. Um, then, then the second part is I, I think it's really this uh, idea of learning how to learn becomes more and more important because the cycle becomes so quick. If you learn Python, so what, five years later, there might be another software language just displacing it. So it becomes very inevitable that how do we cultivate a young millennial to have this appetite to be continuously curious. Of course, I also remember back in my college year, because it's so hard to get into university. You go through cram school and things like that. Once you landed in Hong Kong University, you're done. Stop learning and party, right? I mean, that is the most dangerous mindset, particularly for a lot of Asian nations. It's so hard to get into university. Once you get there, you're done. And I think it's not done. It's just the beginning. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, Isingya, you have a question? Yes. 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 Sorry. After that, you, sir. Yeah. Um, I, I had to ask a question of the real estate sector. Um, what I thought was interesting was to observe that many of the uh, richest men of Britain in Asia tend to be from real estate. Yeah. And I always been wondering why. Perhaps it's because a lot of innovation and wealth are generated from companies eventually somehow get channeled into real estate. Uh, can you comment about uh, for real estate companies what what would be the things to Right, right. So for real estate, um, the sector that I'm, I, I'm most familiar with would be on the commercial aspect, like shopping mall and things like that. Because uh, e-commerce is big and, and I had done quite a bit of research with one dark group, the largest uh, commercial real estate developer in China. And what we've seen is, you know, the, the, the historical like, you know, boundary between offline and online is no longer there, particularly in China. And I'm thinking in the West, Western world is also will be the same. What that means is um, traditional real estate developer must embrace the kind of new type of disruption entering in and looking at the small player. For example, in Shuzhou, I came across a startup that provide surveillance camera around, but they're not selling surveillance camera. They're selling the solution for mom and pop retail store that they can monitor people coming in, going out, facial recognition, automatic like membership. All of these technology historically can only be provided by 
really established company. All of a sudden, it becomes pay-as-you-go subscription model for small retailers, a chain store, and so on. What that means is, even for small chain or isolated store, their customer demand becomes much, much higher. So in the past, the value proposition for a um, developer or operator would be space provision. I think in the future, it's really helping these individual merchants to run their business better. For example, once you know the customer flow and inflow outflow by the week, if there's a certain merchant, all of a sudden the inflow of customer dropped, then it's in fact the interest for the developer to help them to have their business turn around. After all, there are credit risk. And so it's this idea we need to go beyond our traditional value proposition, but think about what is the pain point that these tenants are having to take their business to the next level uh, become more and more pronounced as I see the transformation by Wanda because of these disruptors entering their space. Um, so that would be one response. That's interesting. That means the, a, a developer should no longer be just a passive provider of the space. And also place making, right? How can I make sure that the shopping mall or the area becomes interesting? Hong Kong suffer a lot because people are very like, you know, big real estate developer are very financial driven. And as a result, you see all this community looks exactly alike. Uh, versus Grosvenor in London, they have this idea of placemaking. They would rather substitute lower rent for interesting tenant and a large number of them so that the community becomes interesting and become more vibrant. And as a result, the ecosystem becomes richer, and so their land holding becomes more valuable. It's again the classic trade-off between short-term financial payback and long-term uh, visioning. Right. Yeah. Well, we're r almost out of time, but there was a question from the gentleman at the back. Yes, sir. Uh, Professor Hugh, I'd just like to link to your comment about learning how to learn. Because I think this is one of the things that is featuring very strongly in the, in the changing world in innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, I attended a conference yesterday where they talk about learning agility. This morning, uh, our minister talked about passion for learning. So what tips would you give us in terms of uh, how to learn, how to develop passion for learning uh, and the learning agility? Uh, not just for us as adults here, but also for our children, which is the next generation. How can we develop that from a young age? How do we learn how to learn? Yeah, so just like big company, big company strategy is always the result of the cumulative decision day by day by functions and levels of manager. As individual, your personal strategy is always the result of your daily investment. So I think when I talk about regain the agenda of your day, it's like for me, I need to reflect which hours of the day I am the smartest. So some people are morning bird, some people are night owl. The temptation is when you're the smartest, you go check your email and browse news. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly the wrong strategy, right? That's where you need the protected time to engage in learning behavior. For me, it would be doing research and writing. Um, it's even harder than reading, right? Writing is really tough. For some other people, maybe engage customer that you normally don't talk to, non-users, to identify their unarticulated need at the best time that you are the clear, having the clearest mind. Um, for some others, maybe to learn about data analytics, data visualization, so that my PowerPoint would be much more compelling. I'm doing new skill. So blocking the day, I think, is the daily habit that we need to really seriously pay attention to. And there are academics who describe for successful people, between two to three hours per day is minimal for highly successful people to have that block of time to do the most creative work. So learning how to learn, or buffer yourself against being replaced by AI, I think that's become more and more important. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid we're out of time. It's four o'clock. You have now half an hour to meet and greet Howard. So, um, so I must bring it to a close, but not before we thank Howard for an incredibly stimulating <laughs> discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Vikram and Howard. My name is Howard Yu. I'm the Lego Chair Professor of Management and Innovation at IMD Switzerland. We also have a second campus in Singapore as well. I specialize in the topic on looking at how established company can generate new growth through innovation. And through my research as well as teaching portfolio, I get the opportunity and privilege to interact with many executives in many ways. This session is about distilling what I've learned over the past two and a half years. So I was born and raised in Hong Kong and I remember when I was still in high school the kind of manufacturing sector in Hong Kong basically imploded and job moved into China across the border and Hong Kong need to reinvent itself. And to me, the current environment, the talk about trade war and trade barrier is pretty much mirror of what I was uh, growing up with. And I think the key here is, as much as a company needs to reinvent itself, for an economy to continue to thrive, it also needs to reinvent itself as well. So that's the ultimate lesson drawing up from what I've learned from my early childhood. So today I'm really excited to talk about my book, Leap, How to Thrive in a World When Everything Can Be Copied. It really is based on my two and a half years of research through interaction with executive, through my teaching in executive program, in distilling some of the key learning, how established company can continue to stay on top of competitions. We're truly living in a world of accelerated changes and for manager to stay on top of competition is absolutely critical for them to have understanding of what type of world we're living in. So first off the bat, we're really trying to develop a long-term perspective about what is the world is going to look like in five, seven, six, eight years of time frame so that we as collectively can develop a shared vision and respond appropriately. One of the key complaints that I've heard a lot from executives is they find their innovation easily get copied in the marketplace. But what I've seen this phenomena of things getting copied, IP is no longer as useful as it in the past, is nothing new. In fact, I've seen that happen across century, across different industry. So what I'm gonna do is to display what had happened in the past, how do leading company continue to thrive despite of copycat type of competition. And after looking in the past, then we extract the lesson learned and apply today and project into the future. To come up with a strategic response, one key theme is to identify what are the seismic shifts in the environment. And in the book, I kind of talk about the ubiquitous connectivity as well as the rise of the smart machine together with the rising importance of managerial creativity. So these three themes turns out to be the leveraging point for company to leverage a point in order to reinvent themselves for the second half of the 21st centuries. As much as this session is about disseminating knowledge and uh, distilling what are the leading cutting edge research findings, it's also interactive. I think the audience would ask a lot of questions and we will have an ongoing conversation to collectively make sense of this oftentimes confusing world and so that we can again develop a shared point of view to better prepare ourselves for the future. I was, I mean, the submitted something in the case of, yeah, it was very interesting. Even Intel is. <laughs>